So in part one, we discussed Craster and how his child sacrifices to the others were a product of the Night's Watch. And in part two, we discussed the parallel situation with the Night's King, another point in history where the Night's Watch was complicit in sacrificing children to the others. And in the two parts, we discussed how the poor quality of an inbred child's health could motivate someone to want to sacrifice to the others, while acquiring telepathic genes may have motivated the others to accept an inbred child. But how did this practice ever begin? How did the Night's Watch get into the business of sacrificing children to the others? Well, it seems the Night's Watch, from its founding, has been giving away children to a party north of the Wall. Now granted, this is a bold claim, so let's look at the evidence that points to this. Now we don't have much history related to the founding of the Night's Watch and the building of the Wall, except for some legend. The Wall was perhaps built by Brandon the Builder with the help of the Children of the Forest and Giants in the aftermath of the Long Night. That is, if the legends are to be believed. And that's about all we know. However, we do have some physical evidence dating back to the Wall's construction, namely, the Night Fort. So we know that the Night Fort is the oldest castle along the Wall, and the oldest parts of the Night Fort, those there from its beginnings, are its deep vaults chiseled out of rock beneath the castle's feet. This shows that the Night Fort was much like the rest of ancient Westeros, with its early residents living beneath the earth, perhaps to avoid the effects of the Long Night. And of course, from the Bran chapters, we know what else is beneath the Night Fort. The Black Gate. The Black Gate, as seen by Bran in Bran 4, Storm of Swords, is a curious sight. It looks like a werewood face and opens only to the command of a brother of the Night's Watch and leads to the other side of the wall. This door, being among the oldest parts of the entire wall, likely dates to the wall's construction. So if we can figure out this door's function, we can learn something about the founding brothers of the Night's Watch. Now, the Night's Watch has other regular doors that lead to the other side of the wall, so this door would be redundant if only for everyday access through the wall. It must have had another function, and that function is likely sacrifice. Now, there are several things that point to this door being for sacrifice. First off, the Black Gate is beneath the Night Fort kitchen at the bottom of a well. And wells have special symbolism in the world of ice and fire. We should note that Septon Shale was sacrificed by being thrown down a well. And when Roos talks about killing baby Ramsay, he talks about throwing him in a well. Tyrion also jokes about being thrown down a well as a baby in an attempt at killing him. Cersei perhaps killed her childhood friend Malaria by pushing her down a well. Dunk contemplates throwing the boy Walder Frey down a well for being annoying, and Tyrion notes that the countryside itself is filled with wells for unwanted babies. Over and over and over in our story, wells are presented as places for sacrifice and for getting rid of unwanted children. Now, in the real world, we sometimes hear about children accidentally falling down wells, but it's remarkably odd that wells are associated with intentional sacrifice. Why ruin a perfectly good well by throwing a body in it when there are infinite ways to dispose of a baby or a child? For some reason in Westeros, a well is associated with sacrifice, and usually child sacrifice. Now, on top of this well, or at the bottom of it rather, we also have the Black Gate itself pointing to sacrifice. The Black Gate is shaped into a werewood face, the face of a god. So if one enters the door, it looks like one is being consumed by a god, which is essentially what sacrifice is. Of course, we know that the first men used to sacrifice in front of werewood faces, as Bran observes a sacrifice firsthand. And we know that at least some sacrifices to the old gods are placed in the mouth of the werewood, as at White Tree the Night's Watch finds bones in a werewood's mouth. Of course, the door is not a werewood, but simply leads to the other side of the wall. It's a trick, really. One appears to be sacrificing a child to the old gods, only to have that child appear on the other side of the wall, perhaps to be picked up by the others. So in addition to the well and the door's association with sacrifice, we also have the legends of the Night Fort. So Bran lists eight stories of Old Nan concerning the Night Fort, and Maester Lewin says that these tales shouldn't be taken whole. So it's up to the reader to determine which pieces are true and which pieces are myth. First, we have the tale of the Night's King, which we discussed in depth in part two. It is explicitly a tale of sacrifice where the Night's King was sacrificing his children to the others. It seems likely that these sacrifices occurred using the Black Gate. The second tale is that of the Rat Cook, a story that ends with the Rat Cook, a giant albino rat, consuming his own children with an unending appetite. 
It's notable that in this story we have a giant white face eating children, and Bran tells us that the rat cook's domain was the kitchen, just above the Black Gate. It seems likely that the Black Gate's giant white mouth became the rat cook's giant white mouth in the story over time. It's also notable that in both the story of the Night's King and the rat cook, one's own children are being consumed. The third tale is that of the 79 Sentinels. It's a tale that ends with Lord Risewell's son being absorbed into the wall. Of course, the Black Gate is a mouth on the wall, taking in those who enter. When going through the gate, it appears as if someone is being absorbed into the wall. And it's of note that Lord Risewell sacrificed his own son, just as the Night's King and the Rat Cook sacrificed their young. It's a third tale of one's own children being consumed. The fourth tale is of Danny Flint, a northern girl at the Wall getting raped and murdered for her transgression of joining the Watch. I do wonder why Danny chose to go to the Wall, and why it's such a sin to have a woman there. Of course, the Night's King also violated this rule by having his queen and likely his daughters at the Wall. We have no sacrifice in the story of Danny Flint, but it's worth noting that one needs a woman to produce children. We will get back later to the tale of Danny Flint. The fifth tale is of King Sherret calling down a curse on the Andals. I'm not sure why Andals are at the Wall when they didn't conquer North of the Neck. The Rat Cook story also had an Andal King in it for some reason. I'm not certain what it means other than animosity towards Andal ways or Andal blood. We will get back to King Sherrod as well. The sixth tale is of the Prentice Boys and the thing that came in the night. Here we have children being caught by a monster and becoming slaves to that monster. This is a fourth tale of children being taken. And of course the others also come in the night and take children and turn them into other others. It's interesting to note that in the story, the thing that came in the night comes every century. And the Night's King, as the 13th Lord Commander, would be ruling about a century after the Wall's construction. I do wonder if there is a cycle to the other's collection of children. The seventh tale is of Simeon Star Eyes, a man with sapphire eyes who watched Hellhounds fight. I do wonder what Hellhounds are? Direwolves? Two Starks fighting is once again the story of the Night's King, and his wife did have blue eyes that were like stars. And the eighth and final tale is of Mad Axe, a man who walked silently and slaughtered his brothers. Of course, the others also walk silently. We know little of Mad Axe other than his name and the fact that he had a red beard. With the name Mad Axe, perhaps he could be a Sirwin, and red hair is considered special by the Wildlings, and Bran, Sansa, Rickon, and Rob all have red hair. So looking at the tales in totality, we see that four of the eight stories, that is, the Night's King, the Rat Cook, the 79 Sentinels, and the Thing That Came in the Night, involve children being taken, consumed, or sacrificed. And five of the eight tales involve something that resembles the others in some way, whether it be blue eyes, a pale complexion, silently walking, or coming in the middle of the night and enslaving someone. And we should note that as Bran, a child, sleeps above the well and the Black Gate, he fears these characters of these tales coming to get him. The Rat Cook, the Mad Axe, the Thing That Came in the Night, the Sentinels. And of course, when Sam Gilly and the Babe do come out of the Black Gate, Bran mistakes them for these characters. So based on the fact that a well is a place to dispose of children, and the fact that the Black Gate is an image of a god consuming offerings, as well as the tales of the Night Fort being largely centered around children being taken by monsters, and Bran's general feelings of something coming out of the Black Gate to get him, I would say that the evidence strongly points to the fact that the Black Gate was being used to sacrifice children to the others. Interestingly, Gilly's child is a literal sacrifice to the Others, who makes a reverse journey from the clutches of the Others out of the Black Gate and into the Night Fort. Now accepting that sacrificing to the Others is the function of the Black Gate, the presence of this door is extremely incriminating for the Night's Watch. After all, the Gate is in a Night's Watch fort, and only a brother of the Night's Watch can open the Gate. Thus, at least some brothers must be complicit in the sacrifices. And the fact that the door is as old as the Wall itself, points to the idea that sacrifice was always part of the Night's Watch. After all, besides this gate, we have the sacrifices of Lord Commander Night's King. Additionally, the Lord Commander in the Prentice Boy story takes no action when the boys warn him of the thing that comes in the night. In the end, the boys are simply allowed to be taken. And of course, we have Craster's actions beginning under Lord Commander Bloodraven, and the later complicity of Lord Commander Mormont. The Black Gate being as old as the Wall itself even points to the idea that giving children to the others was part of whatever peace agreement occurred at the end of the Long Night. Now, one may ask why people would be willing to sacrifice children to the Black Gate. Now, I will say that since the beginning of time, there has always been excess children that people have wanted to get rid of. But on top of this, the North may have had additional surplus children. 
It should be noted that worshippers of the old gods used to practice something called the Lord's right to the first night. That is, a lord could have sex with his vassal's wife first, the night of their wedding. It's a crude practice that would almost certainly breed ill will between a lord and his vassal. But what is interesting is that when Roose Bolton talks about the practice, he connects it to the religion of the old gods. Not once, but twice. And Lord Gargon Coharis of Harrenhal was gelded for the practice by Heron the Red in front of his Weirwood. The Lord's right to the first night does not have its roots in law or feudalism, but in religion, it seems. And this was also the case for the Targaryen practice of the Lord's right to the first night, where residents of Dragonstone saw the Targaryens as gods. Now we should ask, if done for religious reasons, what was the purpose and what was the result of such a practice? The practice would likely produce some unruly vassals, and a rich lord can have sex with plenty of women without needing to ruin a wedding. So why have the Lord's right to the first night? And how does it serve a specifically religious end? It should be noted that this practice would certainly lead to a surplus of bastards in the north. Bastards are generally unwanted, but a lord's rights bastard would be an especially painful reminder of oppression. Northern families would be eager to get rid of these children, and if the wall offered them a place to unload them, it would almost be a service. It of course shouldn't be lost on us that Jon Snow himself was a surplus bastard given to the Wall. Now interestingly, the legends of the Night Fort, those legends that seem to focus heavily on sacrificing children, do seem to involve the Northern Houses. The Rat Cook and King Sherret were of the first men, and the other stories involve Starks, Flints, Risewells, and possibly Serwins. These would be houses that follow the old gods, and would practice the Lord's right to the first night. These would be houses that would have surplus bastards. And it should be noted that Roose Bolton's first thought after producing an unwanted bastard via the Lord's Right to the First Night was to dump that child in a well. Of course, the Night Fort has a well above the Black Gate. And it's curious that, even after the Lord's Right to the First Night was banned, Bolton's, Umber's, Mountain Clans, and Skagosi still practiced it. That is, the northern houses closest to the Wall as if the wall was connected to the practice. And it's of note that it's religion that links the practices of child sacrifice and the Lord's right to the first night. The weirwood face of the Black Gate and Roose Bolton's words tell us that they're connected to the old gods. Producing children and getting rid of children were both part of the faith. That is, clandestinely supplying the others with children was part of the religion. Now, shifting gears, I will say that if sacrifice was part of the Night's Watch's way of life, and the Lord's right to the first night was a contribution to it, it all should have run into some barriers around the time of Queen Alysanne. Queen Alysanne was the sister wife of King Jaehaerys the Conciliator, who ruled from 48 after conquest to 103 after conquest. The first mention of the Queen herself is made by Bran in Bran III, A Storm of Swords. Bran tells us that she's the one that expanded the gift, that is, the land owned by the Night's Watch. She expanded it from 25 leagues south of the Wall to 50. Alysanne actually stayed in the land that would become the new gift one night at a tower, and the tower was named and painted by the small folk in her honor. Now, the expansion of the gift was supposedly done because Alysanne was so impressed with the Night's Watch's bravery. But little is said of who the land was taken from. The Wall is 100 leagues long, thus the new gift is about 30,000 square miles in size, or roughly the size of Maine or South Carolina and it's good land for farming. The lords losing this land and its incomes would have been furious. Looking at the map, we can deduce that the losing lords would have been the Umbers and the Mountain Clans, as well as the Starks, who the Umbers and Mountain Clans in turn pay incomes to. And histories tell us that, in fact, Lord Ellard Stark and the North were angry with Jaehaerys and Alysanne for this expansion of the gift. Alysanne's tale of how she spent the night in the gift is repeated by John in John 5 of Storm of Swords, and it's once again emphasized that Alysanne stayed amongst the small folk. They were the ones honoring her with the tower, so it can be assumed that, as opposed to their lords, they were quite happy with the switch from being subjects of the North to being subjects of the Night's Watch. John also mentions that a castle of the Night's Watch was renamed from Snowgate to Queensgate in her honor. The story of Alysanne continues in the fourth brand chapter in A Storm of Swords, Alysanne didn't just stay with the small folk, strip the lands from the north, and hand them to the watch. She also had the night fort closed, and a new fort, Deep Lake, built seven miles to the east. The queen even donated her own jewels to pay for its construction. 
The final story of Alisane comes in Reek 3, A Dance with Dragons, when Roose Bolton tells us that Jaehaerys abolished the Lord's Right to the First Knight to appease his shrewish queen. He clearly has a low opinion of her, and admits that the Boltons, Umbers, Mountain Clans, and Skigosi still practice the Lord's Right to the First Knight in violation of Alisane's law. So in our main story, we really only learn four things about Alisane. She gave the Watch the new gift after staying with the small folk, she closed the Night Fort and built Deep Lake, she abolished the Lord's Right to the First Knight, and Queen's Gate was named for her from Snowgate. And so the evidence suggests that the Night Fort was a place of child sacrifice, and the Lord's Right to the First Knight would produce surplus children. And Alisane seems to have stayed on either Umber or Mountain Clan lands, and Umber and Mountain Clans were specifically named as ardent practicers of the Lord's Right to the First Knight. And Alisane would have stayed with Umber or Mountain Clan small folk, that is, their victims. And the Northern Lords seem to dislike Alisane while their former small folk honor her. And so it seems almost certain that Alisane did something to benefit these small folk while angering their lords, and I would surmise that it was freeing them of Northern rule and ending the Lord's right to the first knight. I would also guess that she moved the Knight's Watch from the Night Fort to Deep Lake to prevent the use of the Black Gate for sacrifice. And of course, a fort being named Snowgate could be interpreted as being named Bastard's Gate. With the ending of Child Sacrifice, the fort would need to be renamed. If there was sacrifice going on at the Wall, Alisane would have severely stifled it. She shut down a cause for surplus bastards, and she shut down a point of sacrifice at the Night Fort. The Alisane reforms would explain why the Night's Watch needed to move Child Sacrifice operations north to Craster's Keep. Now there is a question of, if human sacrifice stopped under Alisane, how are the others placated until the time of Bloodraven and Craster's Keep? I wish I had a clear answer to this, but our author has given us very little information about this time period. It's about 150 years, give or take a decade, between the time of the Alisane reforms and the time of Bloodraven. My best guess on what happened is either the Night's Watch continued to practice child sacrifice clandestinely, or without the wall the others would take children from the wildlings, or perhaps the others only collect children during certain periods of time. This is what we do know about that 150 years. We know that the Alisane reforms did not go over very well in the North, which seemed to have caused an Ellard Stark to support Corlys Valarian and his son Lenor Valarian in the Great Council of 101. The Valarians, by the way, were practicers of the Lord's Right to the First Knight, producing the dragon seeds of Adam and Alan of Hull. Later, a Cregan Stark continued to support the Valarians during the Dance of the Dragons, and Cregan was supported by an army called the Winter Wolves. They supposedly rallied together because of a fear of winter. Cregan supported the Blacks in the Dance of the Dragons after being offered a Targaryen bride, and there was talk of dragon eggs being left at Winterfell. I do wonder if this fear of winter was really a fear of the Others, and if Cregan thought an alliance with dragon riders could defeat the Others if attacked. What's very, very odd is that Cregan never got his Targaryen bride, and was instead given Black Alisane Blackwood. Now Cregan's replacement wife raises quite a few eyebrows. She has the name Alisane, and she's of the House of Bloodraven. Alisane Blackwood was even an archer and a military commander, as readers were clearly supposed to make the connection to Bloodraven, but it's unknown to what end. After not acquiring the special genes of House Targaryen or House Valarian, was Cregan Stark looking for special genes in House Blackwood? After Cregan, history becomes even foggier, we know there's an uprising on Skagos, and then we enter the She-Wolves' succession crisis period. I could do an entire video on the She-Wolves, which were going to be a Duncan Egg story, but long story short, it seems that women were being passed over to ensure male Stark rulers in Winterfell. The problem was the men kept dying, and the young ones weren't old enough to rule. Widows struggled for power, with houses like Umber and Manderley taking sides. And after the She-Wolves period, we have the attack of Raymond Redbeard, the King Beyond the Wall, on the north. And so even though the period of time between Queen Alicent and Bloodraven is elusive, we do have many of the same issues enduring. We have anger about the Alisane reforms and a fear of winter. We have unruly houses like the Umbers and the Skagosi, who happen to be ardent followers of the Lord's Right to the First Knight. We have a desire to secure special bloodlines. We have the need for an adult Stark male, perhaps to produce a special child or participate in the Lord's Right to the First Knight. And we have a king beyond the wall unifying the wildlings, a unification, if like Mance's, that would have been facilitated by increased attacks from the others. And so while it's far, far from certain on what happened in the aftermath of the Alisane reforms, two general themes remained important for the next century and a half. 
There was a general fear of something from the north, driving the winter wolves and the wildlings south, as well as causing rebellion on Skagos. And there was concern for acquiring proper bloodlines, leading to specific alliances and issues of succession. And this leads into a discussion that I couldn't get into in this video, but will next time. It's the answer to why a male Stark is always needed in Winterfell, and why there has never been a female ruler of Winterfell. It's a discussion of the genetics of skin changing and the sacrifices of the Night's King and Craster. And we will go deep into a discussion of genetics in part four. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.